wow, I love to see faces out there. Some that we know, maybe most of you we do not know. So many changes. You see, uh, I'm 80 years old. And I came into Central Assembly at 17, uh, what was that, 63 years ago. And uh, I, a lot of people who knew me have already gone on to glory. But I do know a number of you, and I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit about that after a while. I want to say what a wonderful privilege it is for Evelyn and me to be back in Central Assembly. We've been here several times through the years. When we went out to the Philippines to the mission field 50 years ago, uh, we never came home. We never put our feet on U.S. soil for six years. We stayed there. I preached youth camps around the Philippines and all over. And, and uh, uh, the little Lord was doing such fantastic things. Things were happening, and we didn't get back for six years. And we've not had a normal deputation furlough time since. We're not the usual normal missionary. You're supposed to be out there four years and back one and raise your budget and go back again. Uh, well, we, we come in for a little while. We're only in for a little while right now. We, we, only, we only have uh, uh, 10 Sunday mornings. And Central Assembly, wanted, we wanted to give uh, as, a, as a high priority. So you're one of, the, one of the 10 that we're able to be here. We're heading back to uh, uh, the, the mission field uh, in a couple of weeks, I guess, uh, November 19. We've only got a couple more, uh, couple more weeks here. And uh, so this is a very, very special time for us to be here. And uh, I want to introduce to you uh, a young lady. She looks like a Malaysian girl to me, but you want to, you want to stand up? Uh, yeah, she uh, looks like she's from Malaysia. And uh, I, I'm, I'm from Malaysia also, not really. But these are Malaysia outfits. You're wondering about these, uh, uh, these things, a uh, uh, Malaysia shirt and a Malaysia uh, dress for this young lady. Well, I'm going to get in trouble for this. But I'm going to take the risk. Being my home church, I can do it, OK? You give me permission to get in trouble? OK. 57 years ago, I married an old woman. Right here, where I'm standing, I married 57 years ago an old woman. She gave this to me. I don't doubt it. Not really. You know, that's her natural hair. Anyway, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful journey. I'll share a little bit about that after a while. We are here not only to, uh, to, to, to be blessed to be with you, but we are so blessed to have uh, some of our family who, that was able to come and be with us. You can see here the first couple of rows here. We have two children, not young children anymore. We have uh, Steve over here. Steve, would you stand? Steve, Steve uh, and, and, and here's Ami, Steve's wife. When we left for the mission field 50 years ago, Steve was not even walking. He was 10 months old when we arrived uh, you know, 50 years ago on the mission field. And Steve is, is uh, they're still a missionary in the Philippines. And Steve will be heading back to the Philippines, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a couple of weeks, I think on the 14th. We're also happy to have our younger son, our youngest son, Doug. Doug, would you stand? Uh, yeah, they're going to see you around, of course. Doug and Janine, would you stand? <laughs> Janine, would you stand also? Okay. Doug and Janine, our two sons and, and their wives. And, and Doug and Janine have two wonderful daughters. Our, our granddaughters are not able to be here. Steve has uh, three sons, uh, uh, and only one can be here. This is Ethan. Would you stand, please? Ethan, 17 years old. Yeah, yes, we're just so glad to have them here. And over here, we have a young lady, which is our granddaughter. Yes. Steve's oldest son, Chad, 32 years old, is married to this young British girl. Would you stand, Lindsay? And, 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 our, 
our great our great grandson is somewhere here. He's he's up in the nursery. He's about 20 months old, something like that. She is from Liverpool. I can't speak the British language that she can speak. Li- Liverpool. Okay. We are we are we are such a mixed up family. Uh, Steve is married, as you can see, to a Filipina. And uh, we have the, the three uh, sons, our three grandsons, Steve's side of the family. Uh, they are uh, half uh, Filipino and half American. You put a Filipino and American together, you've got a handsome dude, you know, and here's one of them. <laughs> and uh, it, it, gets, it, gets, it gets more mixed up, actually. Doug here is... Uh, is uh, married to a half German, Janine, half German, and half Mexican. And you put uh, those together. Pardon? Oh, you're part Italian. Okay. All right. All right. Huh? Okay. 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 Well, and of course, our great uh, grandson, the mother here, 100% 100% British, and uh, uh, so our great-grandson is half British and a quarter Filipino and a quarter American. We're rather mixed up a little bit, aren't we? <laughs> wow. Okay, we're going to have to get going here pretty soon. Uh, what, what is she doing? That reminds me of 57 years ago when we were walking down the aisle right here. <laughs> She did make a run for it, I thought. <laughs> she, she, really, she really did. And then she came back in and sang to me. And, you know, she, she sang, Where the thou goest, I will go. Thy people will be my people. Thy God shall be my God. And we made that commitment, you know, right, right here. She's back there running the PowerPoint. And, and uh, wow, wow. I love to preach. Preach a lot. But this message today being in my home church, this is, is kind of celebrating our 57 years when we married right here where I'm standing 57 years ago. And it's also celebrating 50 years in foreign missions. And uh, I want to do something very different. We, we, we were in Fiji, uh, you know, uh, three or four months ago, a little more than that maybe. And the Lord began to speak to me about this for, for the message that I'm bringing this morning, not a regular message, and quite, uh, quite unusual. But I feel like what the Lord wants to say to us is, is an appreciation for, uh, for the house of God, appreciation for a, a, a church that I came into 63 years ago. And I think this is a very, very important and part of the history of Central Assembly of God here in Yakima. I feel that the contribution of Central Assembly and some of the folks here has, has really helped me in my life and helped to disciple me and, and so on when I first became, first became a Christian. So I want to look at the challenge of the unfinished task. And I actually want to give you a look into the heart of a missionary couple. Now, I realize that there are, you support a lot of missionaries here. It's a great missionary church. We, we appreciate so much every missionary that has gone out and is, is supported by this church. And everybody's story, everybody's calling, everybody's ministry is very different. But every ministry is urgent. Every ministry is important. And so I can only talk about the ministry that God has called Evelyn and me to in our ministry, and you'll be hearing from others. Uh, but they are worthy of all the support, uh, uh, all, your support of all, all the missionaries here. They are very, very, very worthy. I want to kind of begin to lay a foundation of what I want to talk about here. Take you to Thailand. The, there, there's some wood carvers there in Thailand that they, they often work together. You see them working there on a, a, a huge tree. Uh, they work to create a beautiful piece of art. They have to chip away a long time to finish the task. John chapter 3, verse 16 lays a very important foundation. It tells us the purpose for Jesus coming to the world to pay the price for everlasting life for all who would believe. We've celebrated that a few moments ago in this service. And Pastor mentioned on the cross, Jesus declared, it is finished. The task that 
The Father sent him to earth to do was done. Nothing more could be added. Absolutely nothing more. After Jesus' resurrection, which you've also been remembering in a wonderful way this morning, before his return to heaven, Jesus gave us the Great Commission. We find it in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and, and 20, a very foundation of what we missionaries do uh, as we go out around the world. It says, the scripture says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Jesus assigned to us. He assigned to the church, not just the missionaries. He assigned to the church. He gave us the great unfinished task. The task that we have before us is to tell the gospel story to every nation. Often, when we see the words in this text, make disciples of every nation, we think about India, China, and all the various countries of the world. And, and in Eng our English Bible, that word is translated nation, and we think of geographical, political boundaries. That's not what the word says. The Greek text for this, translated nation in your English Bibles, that word is ethnos, meaning ethnic. We are to make disciples of every ethnic group, every people group in all the world, not just those in, in, in countries by geographical uh, boundaries. And Evelyn and I are very much aware of that because much of our ministry is involved in preparing people to take this message to unreached people groups as well, as you will see. The task is too big for Western missionaries alone. The Great Commission can only be accomplished if we work together like the woodcarvers in Thailand. This has been our burden. This has been our vision for all of these over 50 years in missions. It's not only the Great Commission and that which we've talked about, very foundational uh, to missionary work and missionary calling, but the call of God is very important in a, in, in a missionary's life. And the call comes differently to different missionaries. You'll be hearing some, from some others. And, and all of our calls are differently. I want to share with you a little bit about my call. Because many of you do not know me. And uh, I think it might be helpful for you to understand the importance of Central Assembly at Home Church. You may not recognize who this is, but... Uh, yes, that's Everett McKinney. I grew up in a very rural, remote part of the United States, not in Yakima. I was born in an un un uh, unpainted house, seven miles from the closest paved road in the Ozark Mountains of the state of Arkansas. My sister-in-law is here in Patsy, my niece are sitting back in the back there. You know Clara very well, my sister-in-law. She grew up back there, back, back there as well. We had no electricity. We had no running water. We had no church. My two brothers and I walked three, four miles every day to school. A little building, not more than half the size of this sanctuary, where one teacher taught all, all 12 grades. We grew up in in poverty, we didn't, re we didn't realize it, of course. But in that isolation out there in the mountains, God loved me so much. He came to me several years before I knew him, before I became a Christian. He talked to me. He showed me in dream and in vision he told me he loved me. He told me that one day I would be training pastors and leaders in the nations of the world. I didn't really know what he was talking about, but he showed me faces in vision and dream. Yellow, black, and white. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white faces of the nations. That if I would only follow him, he would, he would lead me to the nations of the world. I didn't understand it. 
We moved to Washington State, my family, when I was about 14 years old. Seven families of us got on the back of an old truck. We traveled those over 2,000 miles across from the Ozark Mountains. And we landed in Washington. We first landed in a, in a farm laborers camp down in called Crewport. We lived in a tent. We were, were transient farm workers. We'd work in the fields. We'd go back to the Ozarks. And we did this for several years. And then when I was, uh, uh, what, what, about yeah, 14 years old, we made the move, we made the move out. I worked in the fields. One Saturday afternoon, didn't know Jesus. Got in my car and I drove down and parked the car near Front Street. The enemy was after my life and I was walking down Front Street. You know where it is here in Yakima, not a good part of town. In those days, probably not even yet. I had not walked but a few feet until I met two young teenagers, two young people from one of our churches here in the Yakima. They witnessed to me about Jesus. They said, if you'll only bow your head and you know, accept Christ, you know, uh, he has a great plan for your life. They wouldn't let me go. They wouldn't let me go, but I, I still wouldn't do it. But I walked straight back to my car and went back to our little cabin we were living, living in up in Calvary, Titan, and the Holy Spirit would not let me go for a couple of weeks. And then in a, in a, in a, in a big meeting, I did accept the Lord. But it was here, it was here that, that, that the Lord really, really began to witness in my life as well. I came into Central Assembly 63 years ago. I soon realized that God had called me to missions as a child several years before I knew him. He used people in this church to shape me, to disciple me. He used Louise and Carl Anderson. I don't believe that Louise is able to make it this morning. Carl's gone on to be with the Lord a long time. Our first Sunday school, my first Sunday school teachers here. Fred and Darlene Green. Darlene was my first youth leader. Fred is not able to be here this morning. Darlene is here, of course. God has used Aubrey Reeves, who has become my very, very good friend and been friends for so many, many years. I've worked my way through Bible college. I spent two summers in Mexico. I was in, Mex I was in Mexico as a kind of a missionary intern. Uh, 59 years ago, I was in Mexico. Uh, 57 years ago, I, I was in Jamaica down in the West Indies before I was married. And actually, nine days after I returned from Jamaica, Evelyn and I got married right here, nine days after. Yes, we were married right here. That photo was taken right where I'm standing, right here. Pastor John Clark at that time did our wedding ceremony. We began 57 years so wonderful, a wonderful adventure, adventure in marriage and adventure in ministry. And I will tell you that our meeting, uh, Pastor Evelyn's not from this church. She was from another church. She grew up, she was an Oregonian, born across the, the river in Oregon and, and uh, grew up in Tacoma. But, but uh, our, our, wedding, our, our, wedding, our wedding was here and Central Assembly has become a very important uh, part in, in, her, in her life as well. But it is a godsend. It was supernatural, our meeting. God spared both of us. Could have been tragedies, but God spared us and brought us together. And, and, uh, and we are a team unbelievable around the world. Evelyn and I were associate pastors in two churches, Arlington and uh, Spanaway Assembly. Uh, we pastored an American Indian, Native American church. God did wonderful things there. Uh, after that, I get depleted an education, uh, completed an a, a education degree, became a, cert, came, became a certified high school teacher in the state of Washington, uh, and before going to the Philippines. And of course, Evelyn, uh, Evelyn is, uh, is a school teacher as well. Later on, we went to the seminary, HETS, uh, in, in, in Springfield. We did our uh, MDiv and D, a Doctor of Ministry Studies, uh, at, at uh, Portland at Western Seminaries. We went on and on and on and on. Evelyn's call is different. 
She grew up in a, in a, in a very, very poor uh, shoe repairman's home. He was a logger, and he got injured, and then he became a shoe repairman. She grew up in a very strong church. She was born on Thursday, uh, 81 years ago, and on Sunday she was in an Assembly of God church and has been in Assemblies of God ever since. When missionaries would come by her little church, they would, she, when they could, they would invite them to come into their little two-room home. Not two-room, not two-bedroom, two-room home and, 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 ha and, ha and have dinner. Well, she majored in college in Seattle Pacific University. She majored in missions and education, and, and she was teaching school when we met, not, not in Yakima. So both of us prepared to be teachers in addition to ministry training. Our ministry for 50 years has been reaching the lost. That's primary. Evangelism, sharing Christ, getting as many people saved as we can. But when they are saved, they must be trained. They must, the found must be discipled. And this has been a part of our ministry. Our primary teaching ministry in Bible colleges, Asia Pacific, over 100 Bible colleges. Evelyn and I are education consultants and, 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 and are available in over 100 schools uh, throughout the, uh, this, uh, this, this part of the world, as well as uh, Asia, as well as other, other parts of the world. We work, uh, work with four graduate level seminaries, APTS, Asia Pacific Theological Seminary. We'll mention these a little, a little bit later, some more. We work with Southern, in Southern Asia Bible College. They have all the way through a doctor of ministry program. And we work with Continental Theological Seminary, a master's level in, in, in Brussels, Belgium, for that part of the world. So we are, we are involved in, in training people and working with faculty and leaders and, and, and preparing leaders in so many, many countries of the world. We also do pastors' conferences, missions conferences, and, and prepare teachers for uh, church and, and Bible school. Just take a very few moment, moments, and I, and I want to show you not just the fruit of, of the ministry that we have enjoyed, but it is the ministry of Central Assembly, the fruit of this ministry. Our students, that is your fruit as well as ours, they are now helping to bring closure to the Great Commission and those that we have helped to disciple and train in the nations of the world, they are now serving, many of them as missionaries, in over 100 countries of the world. That's Central Assembly. You've been a part of that for 50 years. Let me just give you a few examples of the many, many places that we teach. We teach in the country of Romania the last 15 years or so. We teach in two missionary training schools, a very poor country, Romania, but with vision for missions. One is near the Black Sea, and the other is over near, uh, over near the country of Hungary, where we teach every year. Our Romanian students, we help to train and disciple, go to very hard places. They go to places like Afghanistan. This couple that you see there, uh, Afghanistan, has served for 17 years in Afghanistan. George, you see him there. George was our student in Malaysia 25 years ago in Romania, and our student at CTS in Brussels, Belgium, master's level as well, serving in, in tough, tough places. They go from Romania to Macedonia, reaching Albanian and Turkish Muslims living there in that needy country of Macedonia. They go from Romania to Egypt. This young lady with Evelyn there, she, she is in Egypt. She's hoping to be able to get a visa into Sudan call of God upon her life for there. They go to the Middle East, obviously not mentioning the name of that, of that country. They go to Nambia, a desert country in Africa. They go to Uganda, reaching remote villages. This couple have been there many years and came back last year there to do a little refresher with us. You see us there in the classroom together. They go from Romania to Mongolia, Two couples now cope with desert long distances. They travel long, 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 long distance places in very, very harsh winters. That's some of the fruit from Romania. Romania now has a, 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 a plan to, that Romanian young people called of God can get to the mission field. We now have over 70 Romanian missionaries serving in tough places in many countries of the world. We also teach in, Roma in, 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 in Myanmar. Students go to remote places from there. Here we see, I was doing a spiritual emphasis week in the Bible college. Uh, 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 
those that we help to train, they go to, some of them go to the 30 plus unreached people groups in Myanmar, even though we have a, a, a lot of, of very strong churches there as well. We teach in India. Students go from India to some of the unreached people groups and other, uh, a lot of ministries all over India and, India and even other countries. Do you know that in India alone, even though we have many large churches, there's still over 3,000 unreached people groups in India. So in our training pastors and leaders, we are challenging and motivating them to reach beyond borders and, and, and regions and, and, and reach to, the, to, to those people that are still un, unreached. We teach in BN. There's a reason it's BN. Very close, radical Buddhist country. We teach in underground training centers. The, seat, the picture you have there is an Asia Pacific Theological Seminary master's level training program. That's Evelyn and I teaching there, underground, unknown. We could be in prison. We could be in prison if they, if they knew we were there. Students that we train plant churches, plant underground churches. Here we see a Buddhist monastery in a high mountain area, shows the rugged terrain. We teach in Nepal. Mount Everest and the birthplace of Buddha is there. They have an anti-conversion law was passed not so long ago. Students go from Nepal to remote areas, a lot of rugged terrain. They go to northern India. Very difficult for us to get in there, but Nepalese students that we have to train, they can get in there. We teach in Ukraine, an evangel theological seminary, master's level program. You're aware of the war turned eastern, eastern Ukraine. They go to Muslim countries in Central Asia, Countries like Uzbekistan, they go back to Russia. Vast country covering 11 time zones. Evelyn and I teach across Russia and that part of the world as well. We also teach at APTS. We're talking about your ministry, not just ours, but one missionary couple. Students come from many nations and go to many nations. Evelyn and I have a 42-year a history with APTS. I served as president for a number of years. We now have our first Asian president, E. Tom Wan, Tom Wan, our president of the school I used to be president of, he, he was our student in Malaysia 25 years ago. Incredible what God is doing. I will not share what the countries that these young people are there. If I, if I mentioned, you would be amazed. You would be amazed. I want to show you just a few examples of how students scatter from APTS uh, to minister, often where we could not go. They go back to BN, that very close nation. A few of them were able to get out of that country and get to our campus in the Philippines. And they're back in BN now. They teach in underground schools, training centers. They pastor underground churches. They use friendship evangelism. They go back to the country of Pakistan. Students come to, from Pakistan over into our seminary, a father and a daughter, uh, a couple of our graduates. He pastors a church in the capital city of Pakistan, and, and uh, they teach in a school near the Afghanistan border. He and I were supposed to be there last year, couldn't get a visa. They go back to Nepal. Nepal also has an anti-conversion uh, law. They teach in the Bible college. They go to difficult, mountainous places. They go back to Myanmar. Where we go and where we're going to be going in just a, a very few weeks, finishing in Myanmar up to Christmas. They lead the Bible college. They train church planters for some of the unreached, uh, unreached areas where no foreigners are allowed in some, in some places. This lady, uh, Dora, oh, over here, uh, where are you? Down over here between Evelyn and me. She was our student 40-some years ago. She has now planted many churches out across Myanmar in mountainous areas where we could not even go. They go back to northern Asia, the various ministries, knowing that persecution and government restrictions are, are increasing. They go back to the Pacific Islands. Many of them come to APTS, our campus in the Philippines, and some of them go back to island countries like Nauru, uh, Solomon Islands, Tonga, many, many other, many other countries. They teach and lead in the Bible schools. They plant churches. Several of them are serving as general council leaders and teachers in many of our Bible colleges and over 100 Bible schools throughout the Asia Pacific region. They go back to PNG, Papua New Guinea. 
Here's Evelyn teaching a class in PNG. Here's William with me directing the Bible college where church planters are trained. Benjamin, our student, goes back, uh, go, goes to villages over almost impassable roads. But they're re reaping a great, great harvest, as you can see. Our schedule for, for, for years uh, is fully booked two, two years ahead in, in, in many, 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 many countries. Fully booked. And so, but we try to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, making room for situations that, that, that arise. Our call to Greece some, some, some time back, a few years ago, illustrates what I'm talking about. We had refused an invitation to fill in at the Bible College uh, in, in Greece because our schedule was fully booked. So they, we, there's no way we can. But we had a cancellation in the country because of some situation. And during that, 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 that time, there was, they were wanting us in Greece. We got another uh, email. God had rearranged our schedule. And as Evelyn read the email to me, I began to weep. And uh, Evelyn said, the Holy Spirit wants us to go to Greece, doesn't he? I said, yes. Yes. And on the first day of class in downtown Athens, a lady was directed to the Lord. The Lord spoke to her to go to this address, to this place. And if you will go there and come to that class and, and attend this place, you will meet a man that will be used of, of God to change your life. Not because of me, not because of us, but he did it. We must be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. At the end of our time there in Greece, God spoke to me, and he said something I never thought I would hear until I get to heaven. The Lord said, I am well pleased with you as we were backing, packing our bags to leave Greece. The Lord came and he said to me, I am well pleased with you because you have accomplished the reason why I brought you to Greece. In 2016, you're aware of this from our prayer letters. I was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma, blood cancer, given a 35 to 45 chance to, to, to live even with chemotherapy. At the time this was discovered, it was discovered in Thailand at a great hospital there. Tumors filled all of my major organs, my spleen, my stomach, my liver, even my pancreas. When this struck, I asked God for one more extension of life so that I could complete the purposes for which I was born. The reason I ask him for one more extension of life is that, and many of you here, if you've been keeping up with our prayer, it's way, way back there because it's 42 years ago. We were finished in missions. I had a brain problem. My brain cells were, were, were dying rapidly. We came to the end, 18 months of a difficult time. I had a supernatural healing. No surgeon's knife touched my brain. I call it a supernatural brain surgery. You can call it what you want. But God extended my life 42 years. Then this cancer. I said, God, please extend my life one more time. God spoke to me several times during that journey. The first thing God said to me was, fight. Don't give up. Don't lay down uh, you know, and, and just wait to die when some calamity or situation comes your way. Pastor said, God is able. Incidentally, that was such beautiful worship, worship team. That was absolutely, it wasn't entertainment. It was good theology. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful worship. The presence of God was here so very, very strong and is still here. 18 weeks of chemotherapy, the people like you were praying, and that's what really counted around the world. And... Uh, during this difficult time of chemo, the Lord spoke to me several times, and he said, trust me, I know what I'm doing. I am not finished with you yet. Again, when the cancer was in remission, incidentally, it's all in remission for, for uh, uh, almost two years now. All gone, all in remission. But I was feeling some pain, and 
And I was wondering, is this thing coming back? Because the doctor said it could come back. And the Lord said, I have healed you. I am healing you. I will heal you. It's kind of like our conversion. Sometimes it's a process. Healing is sometimes a process. Instantaneous healing, sometimes, uh, sometimes it comes later and later and later. And, and then we got the sovereignty of God involved. And sometimes the Lord takes us home and doesn't, uh, you know, we don't get the healing we wanted. We, we, we recognize that as well. A long time after we returned, uh, not long after we returned overseas, we were teaching as we have for many years in the country of Sri Lanka. 20 years ago, we went to, uh, we went to that big uh, rock, that big uh, rock mountain up there. Uh, uh, we climbed that, but we wanted to go this last time, just a few months ago, we wanted to, uh, yeah, a, couple, uh, a couple of years ago, we wanted to go and just take pictures of it, because we knew we couldn't climb that. I was just recovering from cancer, so weak. And uh, as we neared, just going to take pictures, the Lord began to say to me, climb, climb. Climb. I said, God, I can't make it up to 40 steps in the apartment where we're staying in the Bible college. How can I go 1,200 steps up and 1,200 down? The Lord said, climb. And in obedience, we climbed. We began to climb. We made it to the top all the way up and down. These are just the last few steps that the Lord helped us. Amazing confirmation of God's healing. In 1993, we haven't always had an easy pathway in response to the call of God. Missionaries don't sometimes. There's no better roses out there. In 1993, which would be about, what, 26 years ago, I came back to the, US, to the U.S. to be with my father as dad and mom before my mother passed away as, uh, in her early uh, 57 years old. This was their home church as well, my dad and my mom. Some of you, if you were here, you, you, you know them. Came home to be with my dad. And uh, after a couple of weeks, dad said, Everett, don't you think you need to go back to the mission field? And I said, Dad, I, I, I came home to be with you. He said, I'm okay. He was in the hospital in Sunnyside. After retirement, they moved to Sunnyside. I'm okay. I'm ready. He said, my older son is here. Well, my grandson's is here. I want you to go back. The, the last words I heard my father say by his bedside in Sunnyside in that hospital, so the last words I heard my father say was, I want you to go back to the mission field. And I want you to win as many people to Jesus as you can. He was willing to give up time with his son even on his deathbed, that people could be reached and trained. I don't believe God required that of my dad. It was his desire. God expects us to take care of the elderly, all of that, and we know all of that. It was what my dad could do to help bring closure to the Great Commission. 51 years ago, during our first deputation, a pastor noted our passion, Evelyn, our passion, for missions, and he said, we've appreciated your ministry this morning. He said, I'm really concerned about the fact that when you come back after serving a term on the field, will your, will your vision and passion be as great then as it is now? I'm happy to say, yes, our passion is as great as it was 50 years ago and is even stronger, perhaps. 30 years ago, 30 years ago, after 20 years of ministry in the Bible college and seminary where I served as president of both of those colleges, God began to speak to Evelyn and me. He began to say, I want you to be willing to move out of your comfort zone. I argued with God. I said, God, I, I never knew that a missionary lived in a comfort zone. And, I, and I'm glad to see beautiful young people here. You know, you know, God speaks contemporary language. He speaks young people's language as well. You know what God said? I didn't know a missionary lived in a comfort zone. God said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We all understand it. We all understand it. So 30 years, for 30 years we've been living, we've been living a homeless lifestyle, living out of one suitcase each for 30 years, 20 years a regular missionary, Philippines, and then 30 years more, uh, 30, 30, 30 years more. The Lord said, if you'll be available, 
to me, I will take you to places that you've never even dreamed of if you will be willing to move out of that comfort zone. I'm going to ask you a question. My time is gone. This is a great week in Central Assembly, a great missionary church, great missionary loving and giving people. You have been so faithful in supporting us all of these uh, 50, actually, actually 51 years, counting before we went out to the mission field, you know, arriving on the field 50 years ago. Is God challenging you, some of you at least, to be willing to move out of your comfort zone? We were here, Doug and Janine and Evelyn and me, uh, uh, for, for a little over four years ago, not long after the uh, pastor came as your pastor. And uh, when I see what God is doing in this church, and I see the fruit of your ministry and the fruit of pastor's ministry and the, and the board and the team, the youth leader and all that. Ellen and I are almost blown out of the water to, to just experience such an awesome anointing upon the worship team, such an anointing in this place. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I have a feeling that, that one of the greatest things that, that, that we can do on the first service of this missions convention is to make a commitment to God and to be willing to move out of our comfort zone to join hearts with the pastor and his wife and the, all the staff and the board and the mission committee and, 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 all, and all of that. Prepare ourselves Make some commitments, even this morning, before we move on into the rest of this convention, where you'll be emphasizing very, very strongly, you know, raising funds to support all the missionaries and so on. I wonder, I trust that many of you are willing to move out of, more out of your comfort zone and more willing to be, to be involved in kingdom purposes. The Great Commission is for all of us. Much needs to be done. Prayer is so urgent, so important. Such a vital part of our ministry and your ministry. Giving is will be emphasized by you in, in, in this conference. Giving. When you give to missions, your dollars, as you see from this presentation today, your missions dollars are multiplied many, many times over through the missionaries that you support. Through the ministries of the people that we reach and we train, going perhaps to a foreign field, perhaps short term or long term, perhaps going to work or into a school, to a school and sharing Jesus with a friend, with a colleague. Some of you are getting older like Evelyn and me, but you're not too old to serve God. You're not too old to be a witness. Sometimes we retire and we, and we, and we just kind of wait around for a few years. God has a plan for some of you young, some of you older people. Yeah, I know you haven't stopped. But remember, you are of great worth to God. As God has a plan for the youth, for the youth of this church. Perhaps he's calling us to, to prison ministry, retirement home. Or live, maybe some of you are living in a retirement home. And, and I know some of you that, that, that are there, that are my friends, I know your ministry there. It, 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 is, it is great. We are all going, friends. We must make disciples as we go. More than half of the world does not know Jesus, and they are not all overseas. Many of them are outside the doors of the church. Romans chapter, three, uh, chapter 10, verses 13 to 15 declares, the Apostle Paul, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then Paul asks four very important questions. How? 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 How can they call on the Lord if they haven't believed? A good question. How can they believe if they haven't heard? 
And how can they hear unless someone tells them? And how can anyone tell them without being sent? That's the ministry of the church in America, the ministry of Central Assembly. And you have been faithful to that. Thank you so much. Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul said, at the end of his life, he says, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me, telling others the good news. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, near the end of his life, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me which the Lord will give to me on that day of his return. Friends, it will be worth any inconvenience, any in discomfort that we have here for the sake of the kingdom. I challenge you, afresh and anew today, to continue joining with us in finishing the task that our, mas our master left us not only in helping our ministry overseas and others that you support, but also in the challenge, responding to the challenge of finishing the task assigned to you as you walk, even in a few moments, as you walk outside this door, through the doors out there, you are walking onto your mission field, your responsibility. It isn't just all foreign missions, but the growth that we're seeing in this church, and it will continue. I don't mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not guaranteeing a, a, a prophetic thing, but I can tell you what I believe with all of my heart. I believe that the future of Central Assembly of God is greater than it has ever been in your history. But it's going to take everybody getting on board. Seeing this missions as globally. Well, together we can accomplish the unfinished task. Doing what we can to complete the unfinished task. It requires several things I've talked about very quickly, just mentioning. It requires obedience to the Great Commission, Matthew 28 we talked about. It requires also an openness to hearing God's call, different ways that God calls. My, my, my call is just one illustration. It requires a greater commitment. I had a hard time driving. We were coming across Satan's Pass yesterday. The Holy Spirit and the presence of the Lord filled the car. And I said, we were listening to beautiful worship music. And I, and I said, Evelyn, stop the music. I need to say something. As I know we're going to Central Assembly tomorrow to challenge the people for a greater commitment. But I said, I, I want to run this by you. I'm hearing the Lord say something to me, I believe, for us. I said to her yesterday, I said, believe, even at our age, 80 and 81 years old, I said, I believe the Lord, even in Central Assembly tomorrow morning, the Lord is calling us, us, the missionaries, calling us to the greater commitment, a greater commitment than we have, than we have ever made all of our lives. He's calling us to an understanding of the multiplication of ministry, the multiplication of souls, the multiplication of missionary dollars that you're involved in. I want you to think of Central Assembly and the fruit of all of your missionaries. We run through some of our ministry here this morning as fruit, your ministry. Think about it. One couple, fruit in over 100 countries of the world that will continue until Jesus comes. People our age, we may, we may not have long, but the fruit will go on and on and on. It's the fruit of this church. The fruit of this church. What is the Lord saying to you? Praying, giving, going, making your life worthwhile for kingdom purposes. Pastor, 